Greetings, friends. We're here to pick up where we left off at the beginning of Chapter 2 of Arthur Machen's The Great God Pan. We're putting the link above now in case you missed Part 1 and want to catch up. When we last saw the not-so-good doctor, his witnessing friend Clark, and the poor lab rat Mary, the doctor just finished up a failed brain alteration on Mary that was supposed to help Mary see into the spiritual plane, or as he puts it, the Great God Pan. We're unsure if she saw the Great God Pan or not, but we do know that the result of this was breaking poor Mary's brain and leaving her an invalid. Let's pick up there as we get a little more insight into the not-so-good doctor's friend and witness, Clark. And we'll see you on the other side. The Great God Pan Chapter 2 Mr. Clark's Memoirs Mr. Clark the gentleman chosen by Dr. Raymond to witness the strange experiment of the God Pan was a person in whose character caution and curiosity were oddly mingled. In his sober moments, he thought of the unusual and the eccentric with undisguised aversion, and yet, deep in his heart, there was a wide-eyed inquisitiveness with respect to all the more recondite and esoteric elements in the nature of men. The latter tendency had prevailed when he accepted Raymond's invitation, for though his considered judgment had always repudiated the doctor's theories as the wildest nonsense, yet he secretly hugged a belief in fantasy and would have rejoiced to see that belief confirmed. The horrors that he witnessed in the dreary laboratory were to a certain extent salutary. He was conscious of being involved in an affair not altogether reputable, and for many years afterwards he clung bravely to the commonplace, and rejected all occasions of occult investigation. Indeed, on some homeopathic principle, he for some time attended the seances of distinguished mediums hoping that the clumsy tricks of these gentlemen would make him altogether disgusted with mysticism of every kind. But the remedy, though caustic, was not efficacious. Clark knew that he still pined for the unseen, and little by little the old passion began to reassert itself, as the face of Mary, shuddering and convulsed with an unknowable terror, faded slowly from his memory. Occupied all day in pursuits both serious and lucrative, the temptation to relax in the evening was too great, especially in the winter months when the fire cast a warm glow over his snug bachelor apartment, and a bottle of some choice claret stood ready by his elbow. His dinner digested, he would make a brief pretense of reading the evening paper but the mere catalog of news soon piled upon him and Clark would find himself casting glances of warm desire in the direction of an old Japanese bureau, which stood at a pleasant distance from the hearth. Like a boy before a jam closet, for a few minutes he would hover indecisive, but lust always prevailed and Clark ended by drawing up his chair, lighting a candle and sitting down before the bureau. Its pigeonholes and drawers teemed with documents on the most morbid subjects, and in the well reposed a large manuscript volume in which he had painfully entered the gems of his collection. Clark had a fine contempt for published literature. The most ghostly story ceased to interest him if it happened to be printed. His sole pleasure was in the reading, compiling, arranging, and rearranging what he called his memoirs to prove the existence of the devil. And engaged in this pursuit, the evening seemed to fly and the night appeared too short. On one particular evening, an ugly December night, black with fog and raw with frost, Clark hurried over his dinner and scarcely deigned to observe his customary ritual of taking up the paper and laying it down again. 
pace two or three times up and down the room and opened the bureau, stood still a moment, and sat down. He leant back, absorbed in one of those dreams to which he was subject, and at length drew out his book and opened it at the last entry. There were three or four pages densely covered with Clark's round, set penmanship, and at the beginning he had written in a somewhat larger hand. Singular narrative told me by my friend, Dr. Phillips. He assures me that all the facts related therein are strictly and wholly true, but refuses to give either the surnames of the persons concerned or the place where these extraordinary events occurred. Mr. Clark began to read over the account for the tenth time, glancing now and then at the pencil notes he had made when it was told to him by his friend. It was one of his humors to pride himself on a certain literary ability. He thought well of his style and took pains in arranging the circumstances in dramatic order. He read the following story. The persons concerned in this statement are Helen V, who, if she is still alive, must now be a woman of 23, Rachel M, since deceased, who was a year younger than the above, and Trevor W, an imbecile, aged 18. These persons were, at the period of the story, inhabitants of a village on the borders of Wales, a place of some importance in the time of the Roman occupation, but now a scattered hamlet of not more than 500 souls. It is situated on rising ground about six miles from the sea and is sheltered by a large and picturesque forest. Some 11 years ago, Helen V came to the village under rather peculiar circumstances. It is understood that she, being an orphan, was adopted in her infancy by a distant relative who brought her up in his own house till she was 12 years old. Thinking, however, that it would be better for the child to have playmates of her own age, he advertised in several local papers for a good home in a comfortable farmhouse for a girl of 12. And this advertisement was answered by Mr. R, a well-to-do farmer in the above-mentioned village. His references proving satisfactory, the gentleman sent his adopted daughter to Mr. R with a letter in which he stipulated that the girl should have a room to herself and stated that her guardians need be at no trouble in the matter of education as she was already sufficiently educated for the position in life which she would occupy. In fact, Mr. R was given to understand that the girl was to be allowed to find her own occupations and to spend her time almost as she liked. Mr. R duly met her at the nearest station, a town some seven miles away from his house, and seems to have remarked nothing extraordinary about the child, except that she was reticent as to her former life and her adopted father. She was, however, of a very different type from the inhabitants of the village. Her skin was a pale, clear olive, and her features were strongly marked, and of a somewhat foreign character. She appears to have settled down easily enough into farmhouse life and became a favorite with the children, who sometimes went with her on rambles in the forest. For this was her amusement. Mr. R states that he has known her go out by herself directly after their early breakfast and not return till after dusk, and that feeling uneasy at a young girl being out alone for so many hours, he communicated with her adopted father, who replied in a brief note that Helen must do as she chose. In the winter, when the forest paths are impassable, she spent most of her time in her bedroom, where she slept alone, according to the instructions of her relative. It was on one of these expeditions to the forest that the first of the singular incidents with which this girl is connected occurred, the date being about a year after her arrival at the village. The preceding winter had been remarkably severe, the snow drifting to a great depth and the frost continuing for an unexampled period, and the summer following was as noteworthy for its extreme heat. On one of the very hottest days in the summer, Helen V left the farmhouse for one of her long rambles in the forest, taking with her, as usual, some bread and meat for lunch. She was seen by some men in the fields making for the old Roman road, a green causeway which traverses the highest part of the wood and they were astonished to observe that the girl had taken off her hat, though the heat of the sun was already almost tropical. As it happened, a laborer, 
Joseph W. by name, was working in the forest near the Roman road, and at 12 o'clock, his little son Trevor brought the man his dinner of bread and cheese. After the meal, the boy, who was about seven years old at the time, left his father at work, and as he says, went to look for flowers in the wood, and the man, who could hear him shouting with delight over his discoveries, felt no uneasiness. Suddenly, however, he was horrified at hearing the most dreadful screams, evidently the result of great terror, proceeding from the direction in which his son had gone, and he hastily threw down his tools and ran to see what had happened. Tracing his path by the sound, he met the little boy who was running headlong and was evidently terribly frightened, and on questioning him, the man at last elicited that after picking a posy of flowers he felt tired and lay down on the grass and fell asleep. He was suddenly awakened, as he stated, by a peculiar noise, a sort of singing he called it, and on peeping through the branches he saw Helen V playing on the grass with a strange naked man whom he seemed unable to describe further. He said he felt dreadfully frightened and ran away, crying for his father. Joseph W. proceeded in the direction indicated by his son and found Helen V. sitting on the grass in the middle of a glade or open space left by charcoal burners. He angrily charged her with frightening his little boy, but she entirely denied the accusation and laughed at the child's story of a strange man, to which he himself did not attach much credence. Joseph W. came to the conclusion that the boy had woke up with a sudden fright, as children sometimes do. But Trevor persisted in his story, and continued in such evident distress that at last his father took him home, hoping that his mother would be able to soothe him. For many weeks, however, the boy gave his parents much anxiety. He became nervous and strange in his manner, refusing to leave the cottage by himself and constantly alarming the household by waking in the night with cries of, The man in the wood! Father! Father! In course of time, however, the impression seemed to have worn off. And about three months later, he accompanied his father to the house of a gentleman in the neighborhood for whom Joseph W. occasionally did work. The man was shown into the study, and the little boy was left sitting in the hall. And a few minutes later, while the gentleman was giving W. his instructions, they were both horrified by a piercing shriek and the sound of a fall, and rushing out, they found the child lying senseless on the floor, his face contorted with terror. The doctor was immediately summoned, and after some examination, he pronounced the child to be suffering from a kind of fit, apparently produced by a sudden shock. The boy was taken to one of the bedrooms, and after some time recovered consciousness, but only to pass into a condition described by the medical man as one of violent hysteria. The doctor exhibited a strong sedative, and in the course of two hours pronounced him fit to walk home. But in passing through the hall, the paroxysms of fright returned, and with additional violence. The father perceived that the child was pointing at some object, and heard the old cry, THE MAN IN THE WOOD! And looking in the direction indicated, saw a stone head of grotesque appearance which had been built into the wall above one of the doors. It seems that the owner of the house had recently made alterations in his premises, and on digging the foundations for some offices, the men had found a curious head, evidently of the Roman period, which had been placed in the hall in the manner described. The head is pronounced by the most experienced archaeologist of the district to be that of a fawn or satyr. Footnote 1. Dr. Phillips tells me, that he had seen the head in question and assures me that he has never received such a vivid presentment of intense evil. From whatever cause arising, this second shock seemed too severe for the boy Trevor and at the present date he suffers from a weakness of intellect which gives but little promise of amending. The matter caused a good deal of sensation at the time and the girl Helen was closely questioned by Mr. R, but to no purpose. She steadfastly denying that she had frightened or in any way molested Trevor. The second event with which this girl's name is connected took place about six years ago and is of still more extraordinary character. At the beginning of the summer of 1880, Helen contracted a friendship of a peculiarly intimate character with Rachel M., the daughter of a prosperous farmer in the neighborhood. 
This girl, who was a year younger than Helen, was considered by most people to be the prettier of the two, though Helen's features had to a great extent softened as she became older. The two girls, who were together on every available opportunity, presented a singular contrast. The one with her clear olive skin and almost Italian appearance, and the other of the proverbial red and white of our rural districts. It must be stated that the payments made to Mr. R for the maintenance of Helen were known in the village for their excessive liberality, and the impression was general that she would one day inherit a large sum of money from her relative. The parents of Rachel were therefore not averse to their daughter's friendship with the girl, and even encouraged the intimacy, though they now bitterly regret having done so. Helen still retained her extraordinary fondness for the forest, and on several occasions Rachel accompanied her, the two friends setting out early in the morning and remaining in the wood till dusk. Once or twice after these excursions, Mrs. M thought her daughter's manner rather peculiar. She seemed languid and dreamy, and as it has been expressed, different from herself. But these peculiarities seem to have been thought too trifling for remark. One evening, however, after Rachel had come home, her mother heard a noise which sounded like suppressed weeping in the girl's room. And on going in, found her lying half undressed upon the bed, evidently in the greatest distress. As soon as she saw her mother, she exclaimed, Ah, mother, mother! Why did you let me go to the forest with Helen? Mrs. M was astonished at so strange a question and proceeded to make inquiries. Rachel told her a wild story. She said, Clark closed the book with a snap and turned his chair towards the fire. When his friend sat one evening in that very chair and told his story, Clark had interrupted him at a point a little subsequent to this, had cut short his words in a paroxysm of horror. My God, he had exclaimed. Think, think what you're saying. It's too incredible, too monstrous. And such things can never be in this quiet world where men and women live and die and struggle and conquer or maybe fail and fall down under sorrow and grieve and then suffer strange fortunes for many a year. But not this, Phillips, not such things as this. There must be some explanation, some way out of the terror. Why, man, if such a case were possible, our Earth would be a nightmare. But Phillips had told his story to the end, concluding, Her flight remains a mystery to this day. She vanished in broad sunlight. They saw her walking in a meadow, and a few moments later, she was not there. Clark tried to conceive the thing again as he sat by the fire and again his mind shuddered and shrank back, appalled before the sight of such awful, unspeakable elements enthroned as it were and triumphant in human flesh. Before him stretched a long, dim vista of the green causeway in the forest, as his friend had described it. He saw the swaying leaves and the quivering shadows on the grass. He saw the sunlight in the flowers, and far away, far in the long distance, the two figures moved towards him. One was Rachel, but the other? Clark had tried his best to disbelieve it all, but at the end of the account, as he had written in his book, he had placed the inscription, Et diabolus incarnatus est, et homo factus est. Translation from Latin into English, And the devil was made incarnate, and was made man. There you have it, folks. Part two of the Great God Pan. It turns out that our buddy Clark has an interest in the occult almost as fierce as the not-so-good doctor. And something is afoot with this pan guy. I smell trouble. Or is that just goat pellets? <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to like and subscribe and throw on those notifications so we can tell you when we drop part three of the Great God Pan. See you next time when we next read From the Dusty Tomb. <laughs>